Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. My name is Katie Starr and I am with the Stanley Premium Western Forage marketing team. Stanley Premium Western Forage is a family owned business located in Southern Idaho with ideal growing conditions to raise some of the best quality forage in the country. We're here to serve you and your animals with consistent, high quality nutrition and valuable education to keep them happy and healthy. So we're gonna do something a little bit different for this webinar if you guys have been on in the past. Stanley has put on a number of webinars over the past couple of years on a variety of topics. Normally we have about 10 or 15 minutes at the end that we leave for questions. But this webinar is our first open nutrition forum with the opportunity for you to ask any nutrition related question that you have. If you happen to be new to joining our webinars though, we'll take a minute to go over a few items so you're comfortable with viewing and participating in our webinar. If you're viewing this as a recording, feel free to skip over this section. And as a heads up, we will have a couple of poll questions throughout the webinar that we will pause for you to answer. We will also be giving away some free product coupons at the end of the webinar, so you'll want to stay with us till the end. So we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. Clicking on the red box with the white arrow allows you to open and close the control panel anytime that you'd like during the webinar. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You can submit questions via text to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. So please feel free to send in your questions anytime during this Q&A session, and we will address as many of them as we can. Depending on how many questions come in, we may not be able to address all of them within our time frame, but we will certainly use them for future nutritional pieces and connect with you one-on-one -on -one if you reach out to us. We've also attached a horse vital signs quick fact sheet that you can download from the control panel under handouts. For those viewing this as a recording, go to stanleyforage.com under nutrition and then nutritional resources to find the infographic handout titled, Can You Identify Normal Horse Vital Signs? This quick fact sheet would be great to print, laminate and hang up in your barn. You probably already have your veterinarian on speed dial but there's even a place on here to write down your vet's contact information for quick access for yourself or anyone else who helps care for your, for your horses. We've also included a screenshot here of our website with some helpful educational content under nutritional resources, including past webinars that we've recorded, nutritional white papers, and a lot of other content. So that is all that I have on my end. Uh, please welcome Dr. Tanya Cubitt with Performance Horse Nutrition, who serves as one of our Stanley Premium Western Forage Equine Nutritionists. She has a PhD in Equine Nutrition and Reproduction. She will offer a very brief intro into what is normal for horses, since we cannot address problems until that is known. And with that, I will go ahead and let Dr. Cubitt share a little bit more about herself before she begins. Hi, Katie, and thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm excited to um, get our listeners to ask a bunch of questions tonight. I know that we always in our webinars have a short amount of time for questions. So I'm really excited about getting uh, folks to be able to ask whatever questions they want, because I really do believe we are a resource for education for the consumer. But in order for us to understand um, any difficulties or problems that we have in our horses, I believe we first need to understand what is normal for our horses. So with that, we'll, we'll start with the evolution of the horse. Um, I want to talk about what is normal for the horse. Um, if you could advance the slides, Katie, that'd be great. Um, so we will talk about 
on the left hand side of your screen, you can see what is natural for the horse. You can see in the image on the bottom of the screen, a group of horses standing in a field, um, grazing, looking like they're eating a wide variety of different forages, which is absolutely true of what is normal for horses. Um, they eat a wide variety of forages. They live in herds. They're a herd animals. They graze anywhere between 12 and 18 hours out of the day, and their digestive system is built to continually be consuming a small amount of food. They eat off the ground, which is really important because that um, promotes natural drainage of the respiratory tract, increases chewing time, which is always really important for producing saliva and buffering that stomach acid. It prevents muscular tension in the neck and back, and it also maintains the proper teeth alignment. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, what happens in most of the United States is what we see on the right-hand side of the slide. And I know that looks like a beautiful, I'm sure it's a beautiful barn. It's a great, um, nice big stall. He's probably even got a heat lamp in there. Um, but most of our horses are confined to stalls or smaller turnouts and very few horses live in, in herds and they're not consuming forage 24-7. Um, so they're at the mercy of our their owners or barn managers to provide them with their fiber requirements. Our horses, our modern day horses, typically eat a much higher grain-based diet, cereal grain-based diet, because they have much higher energy requirements. Most of our modern horses are living into their late 20s, early 30s, whereas wild horses are going to live till they're about to us, anywhere from 7 to 12. So we expect a whole lot more from our horses exercise-wise, um, management-wise. So we need to feed them more concentrated sources of nutrition. But they consume this really quickly because we hang buckets at chest height that have that narrow base. This increase in uh, cereal grain intake and really combined with a, a decrease in forage intake causes an acidity of the GI tract. Some horses really don't like to be confined. They don't like that lack of socialization. And we all know that most of our horses, there is a big difference between the exercise level of our horses. And, you know, what I want to point out in that photograph is where we have the feed bucket. That green bucket hanging on the wall is right around chest height for that horse. And <clears throat> that is really not the most anatomically correct position for the horse to be eating. So we move to the next slide. I think it's really important for us to understand the amount of forage that horses should be eating um, in the wild or if horses have access to pasture consistently, then we know that they're self-regulating their forage intake. But when horses are in stalls and they're at the mercy of us for their fiber requirements, what does that actually mean? So an absolute bare minimum would be 1% of body weight. So for a thousand pound horse, that's about 10 pounds of forage. Uh, if a horse is really fat and we want to put them on a weight loss program, I would usually go around 1.2% of body weight. So that would be about 12 pounds of forage per day. I typically recommend for most of our horses, though, that they be eating anywhere between 15 to 2.5% of their body weight. So that would be about 12, uh, 15 to 25 pounds of forage per day would be normal. Now, they may eat up to 3 3.5% 3 of their body weight, but a more normal um at ranges one and a half to two and a half percent of body weight. So we've kind of set the stage a little bit for what the normal wild horse would do or a normal horse in a natural grazing um, mode would do. So that's what's normal for the horse. So let's go ahead and, and start to address some of the issues that we have, some of the questions. And we're going to start out with the poll question. Yes. So really quickly, we'll go ahead and get started on this poll question. The first poll question that we have is when asking nutrition questions about your horse, where do you go first? Who are you most comfortable asking or seeking information from? And the options are your veterinarian, boarding facility, family, friends, social media, so Facebook groups, YouTube, etc., or professional university websites and resources. 
And it looks like about half of you have voted so far. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and submitting your responses, we'll close this up soon. Perfect, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. And uh, it looks like about 53% generally go to professional university websites and resources. 37% go to their veterinarian, 5% family and friends, 2% social media, and 2% boarding facility. Okay, thank you. And we will go ahead, unless Dr. Cubitt, you have anything else to, to add in before we start off on the questions? No, I think it's great to see that data. I'm glad that the majority of you are seeking your information from professional resources or veterinarians. Um, <clears throat> I know that we can be drawn into the internet and to social media. So I'm glad to see that our, our listeners today are not drawn into that. So let's go ahead and answer some questions. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to get started with a question from Lynn who asks, can I feed alfalfa to laminitis horses 15 years old to 19? Two of mine have issues with green grass spring and fall, so have to muzzle them for a while. So Lynn, that is a great question and it really depends on one thing. Are your horses overweight or are they in good body condition? Because uh, alfalfa is high in calories, so it will put weight on your horse, but it's very low in sugars and starches. So if your answer was, well, I've got some thinner horses that I struggle with um, maintaining body weight and they're metabolically challenged, they've got insulin resistance, then I would say alfalfa is ideal. It's a forage-based product that you can feed that is going to give those horses calories without all the sugars and starches. But <clears throat> if you have a horse that's overweight, then alfalfa is not ideal because it will, it is low in sugars and starches, but it's too many calories and it will just make those horses too fat. So it really depends on the body, current body weight of your horses. Okay. And she had a follow-up question too. Is there a supplement that can help with the sensitivity these horses have? Um, she's tried Thyro L and Equinity. Um, that's another great question. And so the Thyro L is prescribed by veterinarians, typically for horses that are overweight and struggle with losing weight. Um, <clears throat> the majority of these horses that have metabolic challenges don't actually have an issue with their thyroid hormone, but um, feeding or supplementing with extra thyroid hormone can actually help them lose weight because it can be challenging for these horses to lose weight. Um, so that is a, a prescribed medication. But when it comes to other supplements that are on the market, um, I have not come across any scientific data to date that supports scientifically the use of magnesium or chromium or other herbs to adequately reduce the symptoms of insulin resistance or laminitis. Now, when it comes to laminitis, what supplements uh, the goal is to try and um, increase blood flow in those hooves and try and increase the insulin sensitivity as well. And again, I have not seen any adequate scientific research, and this is a group that's going to the scientific research and the, and the university resources, and I've not found any of that that actually supports any supplements that are on the market that are being touted to decrease the symptoms of insulin resistance or laminitis. Okay, and she did happen to mention that um, body condition for those horses is around five, five or six. So. so if your horses are in a body condition score of five or six and you find that they maintain nicely, then alfalfa wouldn't be a bad thing to keep in the program because as I mentioned, you can get away with feeding a whole lot less grain 
uh, because your calories are coming from the forage, which is where horses are meant to get calories from. It's got good quality protein, which will help with some muscle tone. We know that horses that are metabolically challenged typically tend to lose some muscle tone over their top line, and it is low in sugars and starches. A word of caution is always to make to make sure that you're proactive about not letting these horses get overweight, so monitoring them daily. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Cubitt. Uh, our next question that we have is from Mary, and Mary would like to know how to balance out mineral and other requirements with a forage-based diet, meaning not a complete feed, but instead feeding roughage. Is leaving out free choice minerals really a good way to balance, or should you top dress to be sure nutrients are gained through mineral supplements? This is a fantastic question, and I'm glad somebody asked this. <clears throat> I work with a lot of different companies. Stanley Hay is one company that I work with, but I also work with a lot of private individuals. And I recently have been doing a lot more formulation of diets for people that want to get back to the normal way of feeding horses and feed them a forage-based diet. And these aren't just pasture ornaments. These aren't just horses that trail ride on the weekends. <clears throat> these are Grand Prix dressage horses. These are eventing horses, medium to high level eventing horses that we have been able to design forage-based diets um, for these horses. Now, free choice minerals is not an ideal way of supplying nutrients to horses. And the reason being is horses cannot self-regulate free choice minerals. Free choice minerals have a high quantity of salt, and that is what's driving intake. And you know yourself, salt intake is driven by environmental changes. Today, it was really hot, so I crave more salt because I sweated, or I exercised and I sweated, so I crave more salt. So I'm gonna eat more of that mineral because really all I'm eating it for is because I taste the salt. But tomorrow, I didn't sweat a lot, so I don't have, I don't crave salt as much. <clears throat> and therefore, I don't consume as much of the free choice mineral. Now, salt is the only thing, sodium and chloride, that changes its requirement based on environmental or exercise conditions. Things like copper, zinc, selenium, their intake or requirement does not change on a daily basis. They need the same amount every day. So ideally, what I've done with these clients is either fed a ration balancer pellet, it's going to give you a little quality protein, but it's also going to balance out those vitamins and minerals. Um, or you find a high quality uh, supplement, vitamin and mineral supplement that you can feed a couple of ounces to. And ideally, if you want to stick with that forage based program, then you carry it because, a, you know, a bucket supplement that you're feeding one or two ounces, you have to put it on something. Uh, buying a forage pellet like a Timothy pellet or an alfalfa pellet and putting that supplement on there with a little water to mix it together so it all sticks together. But absolutely, you can balance a forage only diet with either a ration balancer or a bucket supplement, but do not rely on a free choice supplement to give your horses everything they need because the intake is going to vary greatly every day. There was actually, sorry, I, I, this is a, such a great question. I want to follow up. There's been a study done in Europe, actually in Sweden, where they have taken um, young trotting horses, uh, the, the pacing trotting horses, and throughout their breaking and training, they fed them a forage-based diet. Now, you've got to make sure you're feeding very high-quality forage when you get to those higher levels of exercise. And they noticed that uh, when they did lots of blood parameters on these highly exercising horses, that these horses had the same, if not better, recovery than those fed grain. And the follow-up study was then looking at those horses throughout uh, intense training and competition. And those horses competed at the same level as horses fed large quantities of grain. So it is possible to feed very high level horses of forage based diet. Now you've got to make sure that it's premium high quality forage. Perfect. Um, and then a couple of follow up questions from Mary as well. Um, options for low feeding in stalls if you have a horse that flips rubber pans, but she also asked about a slow feeder, options for slow feeders on the ground, which is not able to get pod and a hoof ripped. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that's another great question. Um, what you can do is you can actually get a big piece of plywood or even a big piece of your rubber mat in the corner um, of your stall and you can actually bolt the the big feed rubber feed tub to the floor to the rubber mat then they can't flip it over so that's one option but if you're looking at some of the other slow feeder options there was a study done at North Carolina State actually looking at options to slow grain intake down and the and they were all options close to the ground so it was one tub just on the ground um, then there was that same tub on the ground and they put bocce balls so bocce balls are if you've ever seen any kind of lawn bowls, it's a fluid, a, a water filled plastic ball, but they're quite heavy. They put those in the tub. And the other option was a thing called a prevent feeder. And if you think about it's about the size of a, of a muck tub. And in the bottom of it, it's got little wells. I think it's got six or eight wells in the bottom. And the feed kind of falls down in those holes and the horse has to work hard to get the food out of those holes. And a lot of people actually throw hay in on top. But if you look it up, that's a prevent feeder. Um, and they found that that was, that was the option that slowed horses the most when consuming grain. Um, the balls in the tub, they just kicked the balls out. So that didn't really slow them down at all. And then they tipped the tub over. The tub by itself didn't slow them down. On the ground, compared to hanging a bucket at chest height, significantly slowed them down. So even though they tipped it over, they were still eating it. Um, and it was significantly slower than when you had the bucket at chest height hanging on the wall. One other thing is, uh, a lot of people will say that wetting the food uh, will slow them down, especially if it's pelleted. Actually, we found the complete opposite, that wetting the food actually makes them eat it faster. There are other reasons why I recommend wetting pellets, you know, always in the fall to increase moisture content, um, <clears throat> but it will help them eat that food a little faster. Interesting, okay. Uh, let's see, our next question is from Jennifer. And Jennifer would like to know, my horses do not have much grass. They do get free choice hay. When feeding, I am adding alfalfa pellets. Do you feel cubes are better? Am I okay feeding them the added alfalfa when they are free choice hay? Uh, another great question. And don't feel like you're alone in the fact that your horses have limited access to grass. Um, that is pretty much a predicament that most people in the, in the country are faced with, unless you live in Kentucky or some parts of Virginia um, where there's more grass than you know what to do with, then we're all faced with that. Um, even if, there's a, if you live in an area where there's a lot of grass, most boarding facilities or facilities just aren't big enough or have a, have a large quantity of horses. So don't feel that you're uh, out on your own there. It's great that you offer free choice hay. That is fantastic. So I can continually graze. I really like that you're offering alfalfa because the alfalfa, most of the time, uh, local hays, depending on the hay that you're providing, most of our local grass hays um, that we can offer to a lot of our horses ad lib throughout the day so that they don't get too fat, they're going to be lower in protein content and lower in digestible fiber. So adding the alfalfa is a great way to improve the quality of the forage, um, bump up the protein, bump up the calcium and phosphorus, bump up the lysine and the vitamin A and the vitamin E um, without adding a lot of extra grain. So I, I think that's it's a great option. When it comes down to pellets versus cubes, um, that's just going to really come to personal preference. Some horses don't like the cubes. Some versions of cubes I find to be very hard. The Stan Lee cubes are not hard, um, but some other versions of cubes can be hard. So some people get turned off cubes. Um, some people like the pellets. It, that when it, when it comes to pellets or cubes, it really comes to personal preference as to what you're feeding. A lot of times if horses are out in, in fields, even if there's not a lot of grass um, and they're just getting fed outside, I will recommend the cubes because even if they tip their tubs over, it doesn't matter. I mean, they can easily eat them up. But. Okay. Bonnie would like to know, does alfalfa help hold water in the hindgut? 
So another good question. So not alfalfa per se, but forage in general. Think about fiber creating a reservoir in the hindgut. And it's why we say for horses that we never withhold hay prior to exercise. Because if you withhold forage from your horse, then you can dehydrate them very quickly. Endurance horses, for example, they will never withhold hay or water. And that hay in general, fiber in general, acts like a reservoir in the hindgut holding water so that that horse can absorb it. So it's not necessarily alfalfa, but hay in general. Okay, excellent. Shay would like to know what type of feed do you re recommend for a horse who has severe allergies? Um, so she, they live in Texas and allergic to alfalfa. So if you've got a horse that's out allergic to alfalfa and has severe allergies, so we're going to obviously steer clear of the alfalfa or alfalfa mix products. Um, but I would also then be inclined to, that would be a horse that I would damp down or wet down other foods that you're feeding them. If you're feeding a local grass hay, you want to wet it down and that might wash off some of the pollens that, um, especially if it's seasonal allergies. Um, but Timothy orchard grass should be perfectly fine. Um, they're not going to contain, if it's a true alfalfa allergy, it may be due to some of the, the proteins in alfalfa, um, which you would not get with Timothy or, or orchard grass. But that would be a horse that I would definitely be also looking at some natural supplements that can help with inflammation, things like DHA, which is a potent anti-inflammatory. Um, it's an omega-3 fatty acid. Um, as well as vitamin E and also wetting down um, that horse's food if it's a, more of an airborne allergy thing. Okay. Holly would like to know, can you transition a horse from a grain and forage diet to a forage only diet? Um, so this kind of goes back to our uh, question earlier about can we have horses on a forage only diet and do we need to feed them grain? Um, and if you're feeding premium quality forage and you're working closely with a nutritionist, then absolutely you can transition horses off a grain based product to forage and a ration balancer or a, you know, a vitamin mineral supplement. As I said, I err on the side of caution. I don't like to feed free choice minerals because I just don't think horses self-regulate well. But you absolutely can transition horses off a off a grain based diet as long as you have access to a consistent premium quality source of forage, which obviously you do with, uh, with Stanley because you can access it all around the country. Okay, and we're actually gonna go ahead and pause for our last poll question. So the second poll question is, do you feed your equine, so your horse, pony, donkey, mule, hay or forage pellets or cubes? And the options are just yes or no. You may feed them some long stem hay. You may also feed pellets or cubes. Um, that's kind of what, where we're going with on this question. It looks like most of you have answered, but I'll give you just a, just a minute to complete your answer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll now and share with everybody so we can take a look at what what came in. So about 83% said yes, you feed forage cubes or pellets, and 17% no. Dr. Cubit, uh, is there anything you want to add in there before we jump back into the questions? No, no, I think that's it. that's great information to know that people have fed, <clears throat> people are comfortable feeding pellets or cubes. Um, there are very few circumstances where I recommend feeding pellets or cubes as 100% of your horse's diet. Um, it may be if it's a senior horse or it's a horse with severe metabolic issues where, you know, we just can't trust the hay provided and pellets or cubes are more consistent. Um, but it's a fantastic way to extend the life of your forage or improve the quality of your forage. So I'm glad to see that the majority of our listeners have had experience with feeding either pellets or cubes. 
Awesome. Okay, back into questions. Marie would um, like to know, for the metabolic horse, what low NSC, low cal feed do you recommend? Does Stanley have one? So as, as far as a feed, we don't have a feed or a ration balancer at Stanley uh, Premium Western Forage that's going to provide you all the vitamins and minerals. But as far as forages to select, again, if the horse is is of good body condition or is a little underweight and we're looking to gain weight, then I'm definitely going to go with alfalfa um, as a primary part of the diet. But if we're in good body condition or overweight, then we're probably going to look more at the Timothy orchard grass. Now, and that's not going to be a blanket statement that any Timothy or orchard grass is going to work for those horses. But I want to take this opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about what, Stan what sets Stanley apart. Because um, the, the area of the country that Stanley Premium Western Forage is located is in Idaho. And it doesn't rain a lot there. So they have the luxury of being able to irrigate those forages exactly when they need to be irrigated. Um, they really treat growing this forage as a scientific process and they're soil testing every year. They're fertilizing exactly what those fields needs. They're cutting at exactly the right time. There is not a lot of humidity there. The air is very dry. So the, the forages don't sit out in the field very long. And they have amazing storage facilities to put the forage in. Um, it's either completely covered or it comes into storage facilities. So UV light is one of the biggest problems with um, storing hay. The light breaks down nutrients. So the fact that they can get it covered or get it inside and not have to have that hay sit out is really ideal. So you can be guaranteed because of the way they grow their forage that consistently you're going to have the same nutrient value, nutrient content and sugar and starch content is always going to be lower than some of other forage products around the country where they are at more of the mercy, mercy of the environment. They can't cut the forage when it's ideal. Um, maybe it's a little more stress because think about stress on plants is what causes them to store sugars. Um, is it too cold? Is there not enough fertilization? Is there not enough moisture? All of those things cause the plant to store their energy instead of utilizing it to grow. And the plants <clears throat> at all of the Stanley facilities are actively growing. Therefore, they are actively using those sugars and starches and not storing them. So you will find across the board that Stanley products typically tend to be lower in sugars and starches than most other um, forages of the same variety. Okay, and Marie did add in um, for an overweight metabolic horse, um, just wanted to mention that as well. So fat horse, we are going to steer clear of the alfalfa. We're going to go more towards the Timothy foragers, but you must also exercise the horse. Um, it's, it's really a combination of exercise and diet that gets that body weight down so that we can control those hormones. Okay, thank you. And Stephanie uh, would like to know, when considering meals and weight of rations, should I consider the soaked weight? I feed no concentrates, just hay stretcher, Vermont blend, and Stanley's beet pulp and alfalfa. I soak it all. I feed three pounds dry weight per day with free choice hay. I would love to reduce this now that the horses are out of winter, and I do one time per day, but I'm concerned about this. So... Anytime we're soaking anything, be it hay or wetting grain or soaking forage pellets, what you're feeding the horses, you need to take into account is pre-wet weight. So the dry weight of that product. Um, once you're wetting it, then you're just adding water and water has no nutritional value per se, other than, you know, horses need to stay hydrated. So it's going to keep them alive, but it's not offering any nutritional value as far as vitamins and minerals or nutrients. So if I tell you that you need to feed your horse 1.5% of body weight, 
then that's one, that's 15 pounds and your horse is 1,000 pounds, that, fifth, that is 15 pounds of dry weight. Now, if, if you are the case where you're doing 100% pelleted forage or cubed forage, that's 15 pounds of pelleted or cubed forage dry. You might put another 10 or 20 pounds of water in there, um, bringing it up to, you know, 30 pounds, 35 pounds of finished weight. But remember, half of that is water. So it's always dry weight. Okay. Cindy would like to know, Cindy mentions, hi, I have a great horse. He is 25 years old. He's doing great on Stanley, Timothy pellets and hay. He also is on one cup of soybean meal for protein. He moved to a new barn, which he has access to a huge pasture. He is losing weight. He is eating great and in good spirits. What is a good fat supplement to use for his age and quantity? Um, I find that the most rapid way to put weight on horses is um, with oil, uh, just a, a vegetable oil, a canola oil, and that is going to add significant calories to the diet. It's four times more energy dense than anything else. Um, so you can just go to the grocery store and buy vegetable oil or canola oil or uh, some of Stanley's chopped forages, actually, we put some canola oil on there for numerous different reasons, but it does increase the calorie content. So you might want to try adding a little chopped forage as well, one of the Stanley products. But oil fat supplements are the safest, most effective, fastest way to put weight on your horse. Um, also, you're, you, I think you mentioned you're doing Timothy pellets. So you could switch yep. to the chopped forage, but you could also add alfalfa as well instead of that. Awesome. Thank you. Let's see. Rhonda says, hi, my two senior horses are outside 24 seven and have access to a covered round bale. Both horses are considered easy keepers having metabolic conditions. I try to keep with a natural feed hay and Stanley pellets specifically Timothy. My concern is that my horse's nutritional needs are not met, referring to supplements. One horse is 23 years old with heaves. The other is 16 with navicular syndrome. Do you recommend a ration balancer? Uh, yes, absolutely. I recommend a ration balancer or, you know, a bucket supplement where you're getting your vitamins and minerals. Bucket supplements tend to be much more convenient, a lot easier, especially given that your horses are living out and they have their round bale under a feeder. So uh, a ration balancer is ideal. And if you're looking for ration balances that are organic or non-GMO, there are a lot of different options Um if that is the route that you want to go. I'm, I'm personally not saying that they're any better or worse, uh, but if that is a stance that you choose, then there are options in the ration balancer world for those as well. Okay. And I see that I missed a follow-up that um, the previous question you just had from Stephanie mm -hmm. um, about um, soaking the soaking weight um, and feeding – you know, um, no concentrates, just hay um, and feed three pounds dry weight per day with free choice hay and wants to be able to reduce that if possible. So the follow up was she asked just because there's talk of feeding too much at once since their stomachs are smaller. Uh, she was <coughs> concerned about adding too much all at once. I don't like to feed any more than four to five pounds of cereal grain in a single meal. When it's forage, um, the horse is much more able to digest that. So I'm not as concerned and they're really just going to nibble away at it. But I don't want to feed more than three to f four to five pounds of cereal grain based food in a single meal. So that's where the um, recommendation of don't feed too much in a single meal comes from. It's really when we're referring to grain. Okay. And Julianne would like to know, do you recommend checking weight daily with a weight tape? I don't recommend doing it daily unless you've got a rescue horse and you're at, you know, very um, actively trying to monitor their weight gain. I would say once a month, um, if your horse is fine, once a month is fine. Uh, if you're actively trying to increase or decrease weight, then maybe once a week or once every other week. 
but I wouldn't do it every day. Okay. And um, Julianne also followed up with, is it recommended to give a daily salt supplement as in smart pack type? What about electrolytes? Um, if your horse is exercising a lot, then adding a, an electrolyte is good. When it comes to salt, all horses should have access to free choice white salt every day. I don't typically like to directly add it to the feed because, as I mentioned earlier, horses have a you know varying requirement based on environmental conditions or exercise level. Um, ideally, loose salt because horses don't have a rough tongue. But if you don't have a little fancy feeder and you've got it out in a field and it rains, then it just turns to seawater. So plain white salt is ideal. And I want you to have it at free choice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. And another follow up. Uh, along um, what you were just going on was what about free choice hay can horses uh, on a primarily forage based diet self-regulate if given free access yes they can f they they can and they will self-regulate uh, it's a little scary for owners especially and I don't recommend if you've got an, a morbidly obese horse to go out there and let it have free choice access to hay because we need to get his body weight under control before we do that. But we have done research where we've actually free choice fed horses grain, broodmares. And at first they did gain a little weight. But what horses realize when it's there, when it's free choice, is they revert back to their natural foraging behavior where it's always there. And they just go back and nibble on it in, a, in the no, normal natural feeding pa patterns. Um, what you find is when you first start to provide ad lib hay, is horses will gorge on it. And they might do that for a week or two and they will gain weight until they finally start to realize, hmm, this hay isn't going anywhere. It's always here. And then they just slowly start to self-regulate. So it can be daunting at first for owners. They will gain a little bit of weight before they level out. Don't do it with a morbidly obese horse. Um, we need to get the body weight under control first. But it, it is doable with horses at adequate body weight. Okay. And Lynn would like to know, what about using beet pulp? Stan Lee sells this product. Um, beet pulp is a super fiber. In all of the horse feeds that I design, I like to add beet pulp because it's a very highly digestible fiber source. Um, it's not as calorie dense as oil or fat supplements. Um, it has about the same calories, slightly a hair less calories than oats um, or rice bran. But people call, consider it a prebiotic as well because it feeds the bacteria in the hindgut. It's very digestible. Um, it's a great ingredient. You have to feed to get about 40 pounds of weight gain in about 60 days on that average thousand pound horse, you have to feed about five pounds of dry beet pulp a day um, in addition to whatever else you were feeding before. So you, I don't like to rely on it for significant weight gain as the sole source, but beet pulp, especially if you have horses that um, get a little bit impaction colic when the weather changes, it's a great thing to add to the diet because um, you can wet it and make a mash with it. and It's increasing the hydration status of the horse. It will help with additional calories. Um, so it, it, it is a fantastic product for the right horses. Okay. And I know we started just a couple minutes uh, late today. So I want to give us the opportunity to hit one more question. And it actually is a good follow up to um, this previous question from Bettina, I think is how you say her name. Does beet pulp help in the digestibility of a lesser quality hay? Would you recommend feeding to younger horses, like yearling to two year old? Um, body condition score of these horses are at a five. Um, this is a great question. And no, beet pulp will not help the digestion of a lesser quality hay. Um, I guess you could say very indirectly, 
it's feeding those bacteria and then those bacteria are, are in turn able to break down the fiber. But really, we consider things like probiotics, your live yeast culture, more increasing fiber digestion in the hindgut. Um, but that being said, it is a great addition to the young horse diet um, just because it's not too much calories. It's low in sugars and starches because we've sucked all of that out. Um, and so it, it would be a good pro product to incorporate in those, pro that, those diets. But I don't want to give you misinformation by saying that beet pulp will increase the fiber digestibility of poorer quality forage. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt. If you wouldn't mind going ahead and summing up our presentation Q&A session. Fantastic. So I, I hope that you've all enjoyed today uh, the ability to ask questions. Um, but I really want to just fi finalize. I think that it's really good. We started with what is normal. And I think it's really important to leave with what is normal for horses. Because on your own, you can problem solve a lot of, of issues by just understanding, just going back to what is normal for horses. What is 100% normal for horses, no matter whether you do dressage or reining or jumping or barrel racing, whether you keep your horses in a 30 acre field full of grass or a, a 10 by 10 box stall, horses are designed to eat fiber. They are designed to graze for about 17 hours per day. You must, no matter what, ensure adequate fiber intake. You must try and mimic grazing behavior. So the more intensely you manage the horses, the more work you have to do to try and mimic that grazing behavior. But that is you know, when you're making decisions about feeding or management, always go back to they're meant to eat fiber and they're pretty much meant to do it all day long. Great. Thank you, Dr. Cubitt, um, for your time today. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. We really appreciate your time and interest in wanting to learn more about nutrition for your animals. And I know we had a few issues with the slides earlier, so I wanted to make sure that um, I went back and showed this to you, especially for those that are viewing this as a recording. But remember to download this, this quick fact sheet available under handouts before we end this webinar. Um, can you identify normal horse vital signs? A really great piece that hopefully you'll be able to put up and laminate in your barn. And then also this is uh, where you can go and download more nutritional resources, view some of our past webinars at stanleyforage.com going under nutrition on the left hand side and then nutritional resources. So there's a lot of great content on there for you. But before we go ahead and wrap up, I want to announce the winner of our free product coupons right now. And the winner is Laura Shockley. So congratulations, Laura. We will email you to get mailing information for sending out your coupons. And if you have any other questions that weren't answered during today's presentation, I think we got to most of them, but we still had some come in at the end that we didn't have quite enough time for, please contact Stanley's customer relations team. The phone number and email are available on this final slide. You can find past webinars, nutritional white papers, and other great information, including the Stanley Barn Bulletin blog and some great tools to help identify what type of forage is best for your horse and how to optimize their diet on our website at stanleyforage.com. So just so you know, if you haven't attended our webinars before, some of our previous webinar presentations have included beet pulp. What is it and why do horses need it? When quality hay is in short supply, what can I feed my horse? Should I be concerned about feeding alfalfa? And many other great topics. So please check those out on our website if you missed them before. And as you're leaving today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that for us. And please provide us feedback on how we did the webinar this time around with the Q&A session. Did you like this opportunity to just be able to ask Dr. Cubit questions? Do you prefer having it topic, more topic related? Um, give us your feedback, let us know. Uh, we like to be able to make these webinars fit your needs. So your feedback will really help us create better webinars for you. And it also helps us identify, you know, what 
what topics we can use in the future. So you'll also receive a follow-up email within about 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar if you'd like to go back and reference it. The recording should be available for about a week following today's webinar and then available on our website under nutritional resources. So on behalf of Stanley Premium Western Forage and Dr. Cubit, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar and we hope that you have a great rest of your week.